This is Duke University. Uh, we're, we're here this afternoon to honor Bishop Kenneth Carter, who is the Ruth. <laughs> Could we, could we dismiss after that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this is what happens, you know, when the rock star comes on stage. The crowd applauds before they even perform, so that's, that's what we get here. Uh, uh, Bishop Carter has, for the past seven years, been the Ruth W. and A. Morris Williams Professor of the Practice of Christian Ministry. Most of you know that prior to coming to the position here at Duke, he served as Bishop of the Mississippi area of the United Methodist Church and also previously was Bishop of the Nashville area and has played a major leadership role in the United Methodist Church, uh, including uh, among the bishops in the United Methodist Church. And I'm sure he'll be talking about some of that. As we have announced, Bishop Carter is changing his status and role with us here in the school as of this summer. He will become uh, the Williams Professor Emeritus of the Practice of Christian Ministry and will also be uh, officially holding the title of Bishop in Residence, uh, even though he will not be in residence in the school full time, but will, that's one of the things we'll talk about, what he will be doing for us in the coming years. But what we thought we would do today is to have an occasion uh, for me simply to interview him and get him to talk a little bit about both his experiences and his reflections on the state of the church and of theological education. So we will proceed. Uh, I'm going to ask him some questions and let him respond, and we'll see how the conversation goes. But uh, there will, I also want to be sure to mention that at the conclusion of this hour, at 1.30, there will be a reception up in the Alumni Memorial Common Room uh, in honor of Bishop Carter and give each of you a chance to stop by and say your own words of appreciation and congratulation to him. So let's turn to the interviewing here. This is not a doctoral oral, is it? This, no, this is not a doctoral oral. You know, this is more like uh, what the uh, the Larry King show or something, where <laughs> where I get to play the, the Larry King role and, and interview you. Um, let, let me begin with this, uh, Ken. The, we all know that statistics show that the United Methodist Church has had declining membership in recent years. And of course, uh, the Methodist Church is not alone in that. Most of, nearly all, well, in fact, nearly all of the major Protestant denominations are suffering membership declines. And I just wonder if I could ask you how you interpret that situation uh, whether it's something we should be worried about or what you think God is saying to the churches in this moment when we face these challenges of declining membership. Well, certainly, I, I wouldn't say that I'm worried about it, uh, but I am concerned about it. Uh, I think so often we are too worried about our statistical standing uh, I recall when I was graduating from seminary in 1965, the speaker at the baccalaureate service, who was the Old Testament professor at Wesley Seminary, said to us, you will be the generation that either officiates at the funeral of the institutional church or the means by which it is renewed. Uh, I think he overstated it considerably. Uh, I have, however, observed some of the decline, and I've also probably participated in some of the, uh, the death, but I've also seen its renewal. I just think that uh, uh, we overemphasize the institution at the expense of what the institution represents. Uh, first of all, I, I would simply say that the future of the church is not in jeopardy. The body of Christ has been raised. Uh, therefore, the future of the body of Christ is not in jeopardy. 
the institutional form in which that body is expressed is always precarious and in jeopardy, and that may be good. It may be God's way of reminding us that we don't worship the institution, but the institution itself is, at best, uh, not the ultimate, but the penultimate. Or in Samuel's imagery, I think it's Act 4 rather than Act 5. So, first of all, I, I'm concerned, but I'm not, uh, I'm not frantic about it. Uh, the concern often moves us into uh, a survival mentality. If we focus, uh, overly focus on the statistics, we move into a survival mentality and then assume that the future of the church is dependent upon our strategies. Uh, our strategic planning process, our marketing uh, uh, plan, and how well we perform our duties. Now, saying that, I also want to say that having a strong institution, viable, efficient, effective, is critically important. And we need to raise up leaders who can lead, and, and you know, we've had that emphasis here at Duke, to lead those institutions. But um, I don't think, to put it, uh, maybe this is overstating it, but God's preoccupation isn't with how many members the United Methodist Church has. Uh, God's preoccupation is with the salvation of the cosmos. And how well the United Methodist Church fits into that vision it should be our, it seems to me, should be our concern. And I, you know, in the leadership summit that was engaged in last week, I think, by United Methodist bishops and others, uh, the question was raised, well, what is God's vision for the United Methodist Church? Well, I thought that had been revealed. Uh, I didn't think we had to come up with that vision. Uh, it's a matter of whether, you know, God's vision isn't so difficult to discern, it's just inconvenient to follow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm concerned, but I also have hope because my hope isn't in what I can do and what the institutional church can do, but what God has already done and what God is doing and what God shall do in bringing the final, the final victory. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you want to answer this question, but it, it, that you're, you're saying that we shouldn't be so much concerned about marketing strategies and so on leads me to ask whether what you just said has any implications for how we ought to think about this call to action proposal. <laughs> Uh, that is getting so much attention right now in the United <clears throat> Methodist Church. Uh, Maybe you could say briefly what it is, because not everybody in this room is a Methodist and may not even know what we're talking about. How many Methodists are here? Well, there are a few. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the call to action is a, uh, is a plan that was devised by the Council of Bishops uh, and the uh, Common Table uh, largely as the result of demographic studies and, and studies done by corporate folks, uh, all of which has value. My concern with the call to action is it is, it seems to me, is an appeal to institutionalism rather than an appeal to God's eschatological vision for the world. Uh, and therefore, it lacks a sense of... Uh, of power and I think runs the risk of a kind of a functional atheism uh, rather than assuming that it is God who's going to renew the church in God's own time, in God's own way, through the Holy Spirit, at work in the community. But our strategies, though important, uh, have to be viewed with uh, some sense of humility and maybe even suspicion uh, that they could have uh, unexpected consequences. And one of those unexpected consequences is how we, what are we holding pastors and church leaders accountable to? Because the call to action does call for uh, the bishops to hold pastors accountable, uh, to develop and, and uh, nurture vital congregations. But what the, what the report does not identify is what are the components of a vital congregation. And what are those components, how are they related to God's vision for the world and to God's, God's uh, soteriological work? Uh, so that's my concern. I think it focuses on uh, some, some important institutional concerns, 
but I would like for those institutional concerns to be rooted in more deeply in theology uh, than in the demographics and the opinions as people have expressed them through the surveys. Okay. Well, uh, can I quote you on that functional atheism uh, description of the, of the program? Well, I, I sent my response to the bishops so they have it. No, they have it. <laughs> It does remind me, if I could just add, that because I, I actually even quoted this in my, in my written response to the call to action, uh, when, <clears throat> you know, the bishops had an Episcopal initiative on children in poverty uh, some years ago, which I was a part of, and at the Oxford Institute in 1997, I believe it was, uh, I was asked to make a presentation on that uh, initiative in which we emphasized that the initiative is is a call for the renewal of the church in response to the God who is among the least of these, the God who is among the, the marginalized, the vulnerable, the poor, and so forth. Uh, present in that, uh, at that presentation was Dr. Uh, uh, Jürgen uh, Mopma, and uh, kind of intimidating, just like kind of this is a little bit intimidating. But after the, I had dinner with him afterward, and I asked him for his response, and he, he said this, don't, so the power of the initiative is in its theology. Don't let it become an appeal to general humanitarianism. If it does, it will lose its power and become merely programmatic. And I would say that if there's anything more deadly than an appeal to humanitarianism, it's an appeal to institutionalism. Well, thank, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. But uh, since you say that uh, with regard to that particular initiative, quoting Moltmann, that the power of the initiative is in its theology, and as, as we all try to think about the tasks of ministry before us and the renewal of the church, um, let's talk for a minute about theology. If, if you could single out for special emphasis one particular Christian doctrine that you would like graduates of Duke Divinity School to bear foremost in mind and carry with them as they go out into <coughs> the work, what would that Christian doctrine be? Wow. <laughs> now it feels like an oral exam. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like that, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. No, no, mm -hmm. I appreciate the question because I think it is central. I really do think it's central. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, I would say eschatology. Um, David Bosch, and some of the students who've been in uh, Parish 175 have read Bosch. Uh, David Bosch uh, says, if I can remember the quote precisely, uh, when, we, when we no longer have the lighthouse of eschatology, we are left to drift we are left to drift in despair and aimlessness, something to that effect. And it seems to me that, that eschatology, and by that I mean uh, God's eschatological vision for the world, a vision incarnate in Jesus Christ and a vision uh, brought near in Jesus Christ, the decisive victory already having been won in Jesus Christ, of the vision of God's reconciled, redeemed, and transformed creation. That it's that eschatological uh, dimension that gives us both the vision that I think is lacking in the church. I, I mean, using Bosch's imagery, the lighthouse, if the lighthouse is gone and we're adrift without the light, I think that's where the church is somewhat, that we're adrift without that overarching vision, that compelling vision that draws us for, toward the future, but also a vision of a future coming at us, to where it's not simply that we've got to move toward that vision, but that vision is, is forever moving toward us. And I think that, that, that eschatology provides the vision for ministry, and, and yes, there are, it, it's risky to be too precise in what that vision looks like, but Paul was pretty precise. <laughs> Uh, and it certainly includes these dimensions uh, from my perspective, and that is that 
In God's vision for the world, all persons know their identity as beloved and redeemed sons and daughters of God. Uh, in God's vision for the world, uh, all of creation is healed uh, from the scarred and polluted and, and raped mountains to the polluted streams. Uh, to the microscopic cells, that all of creation is healed and restored and, and is, lives in harmony. Where the barriers among human beings uh, come down, uh, that God has already uh, crumbled the dividing walls of hostility among us. God has already reconciled us, and it's living into that reconciliation is our, you know, is our vision. And God uh, envisions a world where justice permeates all relationships and justice flows down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And, and as I understand it, one of the critical components of justice in our biblical tradition is, is what happens to the least and most vulnerable. That, that justice is enabling the least and most vulnerable to ha have full access to God's table of abundance. That that the least and most vulnerable are enabled to flourish uh, as children of God. And therefore, as the, now those should be the, it seems to me as those, those should be the measures of whether a congregation is vital or not. You know, how closely does it resemble uh, God's vision uh, of the future? Uh, it, it's also, not only does eschatology give us the vision, I think it also reminds us of what the agency for ministry is. Who is the agency for ministry? It's God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't build the kingdom. We don't build this new creation. I was told that when I was being theologically educated in, uh, uh, among the liberals. Uh, I realize we don't build it. We live in it. Uh, we participate in it. And it reminds us of, of, it is God who is the agent. So the missio dei, you know, the mission of God, which saves us from what I think is one of the great failures of we uh, pastors, and that's Pelagianism, that, that, you know, that we're going to build it by our works. But it also gives us, a, a, eschatology provides uh, the source of hope. Uh, as Bosch said, you know, if, you, if the lighthouse has gone out, uh, we are adrift uh, in despair. We have no hope. Uh, well, we have hope. As I said earlier, the body of Christ has been raised. Uh, the last word was not the crucifixion. The last word is the resurrection. Uh, God will pronounce the benediction on history, not us. And that, therefore, we can live now in the light of that vision uh, with confidence we're on the winning side, if you want to put it that way. I think it also, uh, and maybe I'm saying too much here, oh. it got me preaching. Uh, I think <laughs> well, it also... I hoped to do, but... <laughs> uh, it, uh, it also, it helps us have a patience born of hope. Now, patience is not passivity, but it's a patience that... It all doesn't depend upon me. Uh, it isn't even going to happen in my lifetime fully. Uh, so be patient. And actually, I'm not even the center of it. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much what happens to me. It really is what happens to the reign of God and the fulfillment of God's vision for the world. It strikes me as I listen to you talk about that, that there are other ways in which some Christian groups in our culture would emphasize eschatology that sound considerably different from what we just heard from you. <laughs> um, I grew up on those. Yeah, yeah, but, but so part of the task then would be not only uh, a an identifying of eschatology as central to Christian ministry, but also a, a critical reinterpretation of eschatology. Uh, very definitely, yes, yes. That critical work, and there's been a lot of work done, of course, uh, in that arena, but yes, I grew up on apocalyptic 
uh, kind of an apocalyptic image of eschatology. I grew up in the hellfire damnation, the end of the world's coming. We got it all figured out as to who the Antichrist is. You know. mm -hmm. and if, but I think it's because we, we, failed, we have failed to proclaim uh, an authentic, biblically, uh, theologically uh, critical eschatology that other things have moved into that space, uh, like the Left Behind series. Uh, how Lindsay's work and uh, these kinds of things. So I, I think I'm, I'm just saying that it, it, I think doing this critical work on eschatology is one of the most needed things for pastors, theologians, and the church today. Sort of a, a Romans 8 eschatology yes. is the way I would think about right. it. The creation right. groaning in bondage but awaiting its deliverance into Precisely. the glorious freedom of the children of God. I, yeah. Right, and, and that, and that, also to couple with that, you know, the Second Corinthians five yes. and Colossians, that God has reconciled all things, that there is a whole new creation that has come into being, and therefore, uh, you know, it's that that has already been, but not yet. And pastors, churches, we all live in the interim between the the already and the not yet. In terms of equipping the church and people engaged in ministry for um, that kind of critical interpretation of these, of these central doctrines, I asked you for one doctrine, I think we actually got several in your answer, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way Christian doctrine is, yeah, isn't say, it? you can't just pull out one right. thread, it's all connected. Um, but in terms of equipping the church for that, how do, you, how do you see the implications of this then for theological education? I mean, you've, you've had a lot of experience. You've been chair of the United Methodist Commission on Theological Education uh, and part of the University Senate. And for the last seven years, you've been centrally located here in one of, uh, in a major university divinity school. So as, as you bring your experience from the parish from being a bishop into this world of theological education, what are the implications that you see for how we ought to be going about our business in the training of future leadership for the church? Uh, and that's in the forefront of a lot of discussion now around theological education, at least in the United Methodist Church. We have a task force, uh, Dr. Warner and I are a part of, that discussing those issues. Uh, it seems to me as though uh, the kind of leadership needed in the, uh, in the church of any era, but particularly today, we need, uh, pastors need three general categories of, of gifts. Uh, one is a deep knowledge of scripture and the Christian tradition. And by knowledge, I mean more than information about it. I, you know, it is in our, it's scripture and our tradition in which we have our identity. And if we don't know the scriptures and we don't know the tradition, then we are a church with amnesia. And, and that's like a person that don't, doesn't have a memory of who they are. We have to ask other people, who am I? And I contend that maybe that's where we are somewhat in the church, that since we've lost our story and lost the memory. So I think we need a deep knowledge of, and I would say it's more than head knowledge, it is experiential knowledge. It's the formational kind of knowledge of, of scripture and, and the Christian tradition. A, a grace-filled character, or I would say character formed by grace, and these are all interrelated. It takes, it may take a particular character to understand the scripture and the tradition. It also takes scripture and tradition to understand and develop character. But so they're all inter, interrelated, but a, a character formed by grace. Knowledge is, knowledge in and of itself can be a dangerous thing. Uh, if it isn't, uh, in the hands of those who have a character that is able to apply that knowledge. Uh, 
knowledge can lead to intellectual arrogance and elitism if you don't have character. Uh, it can lead to a means of manipulating and coercing others if you don't have character. Uh, so character, but it's character formed in grace, that is God's presence and power transforming life. Uh, so knowledge, character, skills. Uh, it requires, and I would say, it, it means the skill or skills necessary to form communities with knowledge and character <laughs> formed by grace. And the ability to be uh, participants in God's mission in the world. And that means you've got, to be, you've got to have skill in exegeting the great texts, as those of you who are seniors have had to demonstrate in the senior evaluation. And I think we do a good job of that here. I think we do a, a, you know, a good job in helping students exegete the great texts of, of Scripture as well as the tradition. What we may not do an adequate job of is how you exegete the context in which ministry takes place. And that's a skill, too. H how do you understand this, the socioeconomic, uh, political context in which uh, this faith is to be lived out? Uh, and that requires some skill. That means we do look at other means of, other, other ways of knowing and other systems of knowledge uh, in addition to uh, you know, theology. Remember uh, one of my favorite quotes from John Wesley. You know, John Wesley had the practice of, of, of having uh, interviews, but the interviews were with himself. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so he asked the question, uh, why are the people under our care no better than they are? His response, because we are not more knowing and more holy. And there followed his directive that every, every pastor should spend at least four to five hours in their study uh, every day uh, getting more knowledge. But it also reflects that if you just have knowledge without holiness, uh, then you are not fully the disciple. So I think that's what we mean. One more word about the kind of leadership we need um, from my perspective. I think we need uh, people who are committed to doing foundation work. By that I mean, it's much more glamorous to build structures that everybody can see, uh, praise and applaud. But you can't build a structure, however attractive it may be or appealing, if you don't work on the foundation. If the foundation is skewed, or if the foundation is crumbling, any remodeling you do uh, will be short-lived. And I think what we need now, but foundation work is dirty work. It's subterranean. <laughs> and you can take that image any way you want to. Uh, it, um, it isn't always visible. Usually the folks who dig the foundations and lay the foundations and pour the concrete aren't applauded, they don't give recognition, they may not be paid as much either. But their work is, if their work is not done properly, all of the other work uh, will be in vain over time. I think we live in a time when the church has amnesia, when the church uh, has lost some of its moorings, the light, uh, the lighthouse image, uh, and I think we need some folks who are devoted to doing that foundation work of teaching teaching, teaching, forming practices in local, uh, maybe obscure situations, and the foundation gets repaired. So in light of all that, uh, do you think that you would be, that you want to offer some specific recommendations about the way that the theological curriculum of a place like Duke Divinity School ought to be structured. 
Mm. Are there ways you'd like to see it changed or reformed? I shouldn't ask you this question, because if you say something too compelling, I'll have to appoint a committee, and it will be more, <laughs> more work for all the rest of us. But we And I'm retired. I can't serve no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're free, then, to say what you think. Well, I, it would be presumptuous somewhat for me to... I mean, I, I can't speak definitively on this, certainly. I do think, however, that we that one of the critical needs is for us to strengthen the dialogue between the church and the academy. I think one of the problems in theological education is, both, in, both on the part of the church and the academy, is we don't know what each is supposed to do. I mean, that is, the church doesn't, is not clear in what it expects of the divinity school, for example. And the divinity school uh, isn't always clear as to whether we are, where our primary allegiance is in the academy or in the church. And which, you know, who, who is our master? Uh, is the master of the church or is the master of the academy? I'm not saying it has to be one or the other, but I think we have to be clear as, we need more clarity as to what, um, what is the relationship between the church and, and his scholarship. Um, I think we've made enormous progress. I, I think there's a danger, um, well, I'm going to coin a, a phrase that may not be, maybe in this company it should not be coined, but I, I think it's easy to develop a kind of an ecclesial Gnosticism. I mean, that is that, that the church, uh, in, the church is saved by special knowledge. And if we just get it right, uh, intellectually, if we just have the right knowledge, uh, and we do that in isolation from the world out there. Uh, you know, these last seven years, I've lived in South Durham in a condo. I drive up Hope Valley. Uh, I've driven up Hope Valley Road, come in through your know, Duke Forest, uh, drive up. It's a beautiful drive. I, do, I love to drive it. And then I come into on Science Drive, even drive into the parking deck, and walk across beautiful manicured gardens and uh, go into my office always uh, pretty well heated and cooled got all the equipment I need uh, I can begin to assume that's how the world is in isolation from what's happening out in Durham uh, all the prisons we've got around here we may say something about that in a few moments mm -hmm. And, and, and therefore, we can develop this notion that if we just get it right here, uh, then pastors go out from here assuming I can do my, if we think we can just teach theology, biblical studies, and church history, and worship in an enclave on Duke campus, unrelated to the world of suffering and hurt and pain and anguish out there, including right over here within walking distance, then we lay the foundation for pastors to assume, well, I can do my pastoral work in the confines of this building, and the community around me can go to hell. And many of them are going to hell. And I mean that in terms of economic decline, uh, the demographics change, and we're not one of the saddest things I ever did as a bishop was to close churches. Churches that were in places where the population was larger when it closed than it was when it was built. It's just the color of the people had changed. The socioeconomic level of the people had changed. But the, somehow, and mo many of those United Methodist churches, their pastors were educated in United Methodist seminaries, they used United Methodist curriculum, they sang out United Methodist hymnal, they seemed to do everything right, except they lived in isolation from the people who surrounded them. And, and therefore, I think uh, what, whatever we can do at Duke, and I, practicing theology and ministry, for example, is one way we're doing it. Uh, field placement, uh, how, how important they are. Um, I would even say the prison, uh, the new certificate in prison ministry is, is one way. Uh, that is some, and how do, and, and the international, or the, the international placements, I mean, at least my experience, I know some of you have gone to South Africa, or Mozambique, uh, uh, Uganda, and other places. My own sense is you come back transformed. You, you, you see things through different lenses uh, in many ways. And I think another thing that I would say, um, 
that I would like to see us do, uh, we do it, but I, maybe I would suggest we, it would be helpful for us to do more of it, and that is to, uh, to help pastors, these future pastors, church leaders, to have lenses and languages uh, diverse lenses and lang di diverse theological lenses and languages through which to perform and fulfill their pastoral role. Uh, the tendency can become that we so critique theologies, process, liberation, personalism, feminism, whatever, we critique it without the charitable understanding that these theologies may, may provide some lenses and some languages which in some contexts can help to relate the gospel. Illustration. I served in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I was one of the highest concentration of scientists of any community, maybe that church. At that time, this was in the 80s, had the highest percentage of PhD scientists probably in United Methodist Church. A couple of hundred of them, I didn't need any more. <laughs> My rather superficial understanding of process thought helped me to establish some contacts with some physicists and scientists that I could not have contacted with if I had no at least some exposure to it. So I'm just, I, I think if we can see the varieties of theological languages and perspectives and not get so locked in that God is bigger than all of our theologies. Well, thank you for that. What, you, you mentioned something I did want to ask you about because uh, the emphasis on prison ministries is something that has been an emphasis that you have brought to us. I think it would be fair to say that before you came here to Duke Divinity School, we did not have uh, any developed program in relation to prison ministries. And as you just mentioned, uh, that has now reached the point where the faculty has recently approved the uh, formalization of a certificate in prison ministries as something that's going to be an option for students going forward. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that and t tell us why you think that's an important emphasis for the school and for the church in our time. Uh, <clears throat> some of the students that have, uh, have been in my classes, uh, especially if you've been in the world on restorative justice in prisons, have heard my story on this. But as a young pastor, uh, in 1968, I've been out of seminary three years, uh, a federal district judge did the laity address at the Holston Annual Conference. That federal judge, his name was Frank B. Wilson. Judge Wilson uh, was considered for the Supreme Court at one time. He also, I mean, he was, con some thought he was a candidate for the Supreme Court. But his most famous case was the Jimmy Hoffa case. Uh, and he had been uh, well known in, in that time in the 60s. He gave the laity address that he made, he made two statements that uh, I will have to say kind of transformed and set me on a different course of ministry. One statement was he said, I, I maintain some contact between every person I sentence to prison. I thought that's strange for a judge to do that. He said, now, I, I have to be discreet. I have to know how to do that. But if I'm going to, if I'm going to take away a person's freedom, uh, I need to be more than just uh, the judge who does that. And then he made this statement. Every pastor should be as familiar with the inside of a local jail or prison as the inside of a local hospital. Uh, the people in the hospital have a whole staff dedicated to, the, to their well-being and restoration. The people in the prisons and jails have a whole staff devoted to, to confining them and sometimes, often, their philosophy is punishing them. I've never been inside a jail or a prison, but I felt convicted. I felt that that was 
a call from God. So I got involved, and I've tried to follow that wherever I've been that I need to get involved and become familiar with the inside of the local prisons or jails. Um, there's a lot, there's more to become familiar with in Durham that I can get familiar with, though, because <laughs> we have a whole federal system up here at Butler and then the state system. So that's one reason, but I, I do think that Judge Wilson is right, that the pastor should be as familiar with the inside of the prison jail as the hospital. Uh, I've also affirmed that if you're Wesleyan, the Wesleyan revival, I think we can make a case, uh, cannot be fully understood apart from John and Charles Wesley's involvement in prisons and relationship with malefactors. Uh, but I also would say that if you really want to understand the doctrines of the faith, go to prison. Uh, you think you understand sin until you get in the midst of a prison and you're sitting across on death row from some who have committed heinous crimes. It also is a way of getting familiar with systemic sin how the system itself compounds the problem. Um, so that if you want to understand reconciliation, if you want to understand forgiveness, and why forgiveness involves a cross, go to jail. Get involved in the criminal justice system and listen to the victims of crime. And to talk to them about uh, Oh, just forgive. If your child's been murdered, uh, that can be cheap talk and pushes you beneath the superficial. So these doctrines are not abstract. They become operational in the lives of people. And if you really want to see God's grace at work in transforming lives, go to prison. You can see it transform. And I, it should be surprising was not our faith born in prison or in the midst of execution? I mean, Jesus was the victim of another culture's capital punishment. And, you know, did not, uh, our, did not God's mighty act begin in Scripture with deliverance from prison, oppression, exile, uh, so I think to understand even the context and Paul's letters, I dare not go too far here sitting beside uh, <laughs> the expert, but can you really understand fully the context of, of what Paul was writing? I think if you miss the fact that Paul was sitting in a jail cell when he wrote Philippians, you'll misinterpret Philippians. Uh, so I think uh, getting in j into the jails and prisons uh, deep in our understanding of doctrine, I think it's a part of our pastoral task. And I think here at the Divinity School, it does position us, because we're bringing back into the community, I mean, into this community, we have several faculty who are teaching classes in the prison now. Uh, I dare say those faculty members uh, realize and can testify that they are gaining insights from their experience as surely as they are sharing insights with those in the, in the prisons. And I think it does positions. I don't know of any other of our seminaries in United Methodism, we have no other seminary offering a certificate in prison studies. Um, one other thing is that prison population is one of the fastest growing populations in the U.S. And I've said to some of my bishop colleagues, so you want to establish new congregations in growing populations? <laughs> Let's go to prison. 2.3 million in prison today. Well, thank you, Ken. That's very moving. And uh, I think nicely exemplifies some of the things that you were saying earlier about uh, the way in which theological education should teach us all to do an exegesis of the context in which yeah. our ministry is taking place. Uh, I have so many things I'd like to ask you, and our time is running quickly, but let me uh, turn in the last few minutes here to ask you a few things of a little more personal nature, if I could, to reflect both about 
retrospectively about your ministry and about what you plan to do in the coming years. Um, the, the first question, uh, maybe a slightly blunt one, but perhaps uh, edifying for us all. What do you think is the biggest mistake you've made in your ministry? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, boy, that's... <laughs> You know, I, I'm at that juncture of life where I have more memories than I have expectations of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, doing a lot of reflecting on uh, the past and uh, trying, to, trying to understand. And, and you know, it's been a painful experience because I'm being confronted now with uh, the memory of many of those mistakes, many mistakes. And uh, I'm having to reconnect with, uh, uh, with grace. Uh, and that is, let it go. Uh, God, uh, God does forgive. Uh, and I've also realized uh, I'm not as sure now what's a mistake and what isn't. <laughs> is that, I, my definition of mistake has gotten kind of confused because some of that which I thought was a mistake turned out to be, well, something God used. Uh, so was the crucifixion a mistake? Well, <laughs> There's some theology in there, isn't there? That God can take my mistakes and bring some life out of it. But let me mention a couple. One, I think I got, I think I sometimes got my, my baptism and my ordination confused. Um, and, and thought that my identity was in my ordination, uh, the role that I played. Uh, whether my identity being in my baptism, that I'm a beloved child of God, and it isn't, it's all, it's, all of, it's all a gift, not what I've accomplished or what I've done or, and so forth. Uh, and when you, when, when baptism uh, is replaced by ordination or whatever the role, or I would say even a faculty position, <laughs> uh, we, we easily drift into Pelagianism. Uh, and the notion that my worth is dependent on, you know, what size church I have, or whether I'm, what my salary is, or how many degrees I have, or whether I have tenure or not have tenure, whether I, how many books I've published, and, and all of that is a contribution, but it's not our identity. Uh, but so, I, I've, I haven't always done that. I would think the other is um, the failure to be fully attentive. Uh, to, the, to, to God's presence and power in the midst of the routines of life. Re remember that quote from Our Town, Emily in Our Town, who said, do any of us realize life as we live it every, every moment? Well, I suppose that we can't live with that intensity. But I, I was a journal keeper for much of my life. I, if I had to do over, I'd be more of a journal keeper. Mm. Because my... Uh, my own experience is that God's presence and power I acknowledge or recognize mostly in retrospect. That God's presence and power I have found most of my experience at least is underwhelming, not overwhelming. And I have to be attentive, to have eyes to see and ears to hear, or I'll miss it. And therefore, I think I've missed a lot by not being as attentive and even recording that attentiveness. And therefore, what I'm looking back on now, I've missed a lot that I could look back on and, and find. Well, speaking of looking back, as you look back now on these past seven years as a member of this community, what has this meant for you or to you to be here? Or how has this experience of being uh, a professor at Duke uh, contributed to the trajectory of your um, vocation? Well, I, I, I wanted to say that it has been, uh, uh, I, I, I may lose it, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's been, uh, it's been life-giving to me. Uh, and, and I would say that in some ways it, it's been the best appointment I've had. Although I said that about every appointment when I was there. <laughs> Uh, because there was a sense in which every appointment I had was the best one I've had. Uh, but here, um, first of all, I didn't set out on a career trajectory. Uh, my, my goal was to be a pastor and to be the best pastor I could be. Uh, at being a United Methodist, 
Uh, I knew I didn't have to worry about having a church to serve. I was going to, and in fact, I had limited input as to where that would be. So I didn't, uh, I didn't plot where my next churches were going to be or where I wanted to be. I never expected to serve most of the churches that I expected. I certainly never expected to be a bishop. Uh, and I, it wasn't on my radar to be a professor at, at Duke. But um, maybe it's um, a celebration of God's mysterious grace. Uh, so to, to be placed at opportunities. Uh, my goal was to, um, I, this sounds too self-serving, my, my goal was to avoid being too concerned about where I serve to where I lost focus on who it is I'm serving and how I'm serving. That where I serve and how I serve, well, let's see, how I serve and who I serve is more determinative than where I serve. And for me to plot, I've seen too many of my colleagues and too many pastors as a bishop always plotting their next move. And therefore they end up seeing um, the churches as stepping stones in their career advancement. My friends, that's fleecing the sheep, not pastoring them. Uh, so that I have, I have considered my specific calling to work at the intersection of the church's practices and the church's scholarship. Now, I never dreamed that I would be in the midst of scholars to do that. I've always had friends who have scholars, and some, are, some of them are here. And I have valued those relationships, and they've been instructive to me and still are. But I considered that I was one as a pastor who was to help to glean from the scholarship the, the insights, the deep exegesis, the deep, help me understand eschatology, in deeper ways, but it's my task to, to appropriate that, apply it, live it out in this context with lay people. And I, I guess I just have to you know, remember uh, C.S. Lewis's autobiography says, Surprised by Joy. Uh, I think that would characterize my, uh, how I feel about it. I've just been surprised by the joy of the places uh, that I have served, and you've given me a chance to reflect on my ministry. Some of you have list, listened to more of my stories than you should have. Uh, but you've helped me to reflect on that ministry in deeper ways had I not been here. And so that's... Well, wonderful. It's, I can assure you the blessing has been mutual. Let me end with this. We're almost out of time, but I, I wonder if you could say something just very briefly about what you hope to do during the next year and the year after, and as long as, as we're able to continue this relationship in your role as bishop in residence. You and I have talked about this a little, but Thank you. I think others would like to know uh, what to expect about your role in the community going forward. Uh, when, they, when they used to ask Ken Goodson, after whom the chapel is named, uh, what does a bishop in residence do? And Bishop Goodson would say, reside. <laughs> uh, so I expect to reside, but uh, no, I think there is a legitimate ministry of hanging out. <laughs> but being careful where you hang out, with whom you hang out, and what you do when you hang out. I'm going to hang out here with students, faculty. I'm going to be available uh, to learn, to offer input, uh, to listen. I'm going to hang out with my grandchildren, who are the most probing theologians with whom I ever hang out. You know, they push me beyond any of my abstract language. Uh, but I also intend to be in, engaged, and I, I may do some short-term teaching here in classes, guest lecturer from time to time, uh, maybe occasional independent study, uh, but also I'm going to be working the new DMN program. Because I'm convinced that we need to raise up a cadre of 
those who work at the intersection of the scholarship and the practices in the church. And I think our new DMIN program has a wonderful opportunity. If it's done right, as we, we only do it right at Duke. <laughs> it, 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 if we do it right, it can be a means by which we, we bridge some of that gap between the scholarship and the, and the practices of the church, which is so desperately needed. Well, thank you, Ken. It has been a great blessing to us to hear you reflect on these matters. And the hour, from my point of view, sitting here has gone much too rapidly. But we're grateful that you're going to be around so that we can continue to pick your brain and draw on your wisdom in, in the years ahead in the bishop in residence role. I want to reiterate again that we have a reception next uh, in the Alumni Memorial Common Room. Uh, for anyone who'd like to come and have a bit to eat and drink and say congratulations uh, to Bishop Carter and thanks for what he's done for us. It has certainly been for us a great blessing to have you as a colleague, as a friend, and as a mentor. And so thank you for everything you've done.